Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. We're, thr we're thrilled to have Shenghua Tang here. He's a very frequent visitor, which is great, from, uh, from USC. And he's going to be talking about the, um, the Laplacian paradigm, nearly linear time algorithms for massive graphs. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, so So, 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 so in this talk, I would like to discuss a relatively new framework for designing algorithms whose running time is either linear or close to linear in the input size. And we will refer to this uh, framework as the Laplacian paradigm uh, because it utilizes the properties of Laplacian matrices of graphs. And this is joint work with Dan Spielman, who is currently at Yale, as well as Cristiano, John Kellner and the Marjorie from MIT. I think Marjorie is here somewhere. He agreed not to heckle me. So, uh, so I would like to start s slow so that uh, you will have some chance to get used to my accent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I will try to speed up accordingly. And also give me some time to give a motivation uh, to uh, set a stage for this work. Okay. So, so about you know half century ago, the pioneers of computing uh, began to consider this so-called asymptotic notion of complexities. And uh, so those are sort of by today is well known as a big O, big omega, big theta notations. And uh, in spite of the fact that uh, back then, you know, their immediate colleagues, for example, from mathematics, are uh, sort of complaining about this notion a little bit because it's lack of precision. Because a lot of terms, low order terms and constant factors are all somehow eliminated. And the, the, the double E colleagues, more pra practical uh, aspect of computing, also complain about this notion because the uh, constant factor of two was eliminated and hence it's very hard to say what is practical or not practical in practice. Uh, but our pioneers, you know, in persist they moved on, they continue to... Two, because, I mean, I, I don't, maybe in CS it's better, but in mathematical physics, two is often 10 to the 9 or something like that. So, so, so you, can, you can hide any constant there. So our pioneers moved on, marched on, and uh, they continue to use a symptotic notion to define a, a computational class. For example, uh, the class called P, the set of problems that can be solved in polynomial time, uh, with help not just big O notation and another sort of set of uh, many constants, right? And it also gave a rise, perhaps one of the most fundamental questions in mathematics and uh, computation, that is with NP is equal to P, right? So, so part of their persistence is built upon <coughs> their vision that, uh, you know, one day the problem side will become really large. Not only we have to solve larger problems, but we are capable to solve larger problems. And even though at that time, so this is like, you know, 50s, 60s, <coughs> for example, the largest linear system people are playing with is about certain variables. The largest linear programming is probably between 50 to 100 variables. The, the graph they are playing with is typically about 100 nodes, right? And uh, it's great that the vision of our pioneer pioneered out that uh, in many ways, today we enter the stage, you know, we begin to enter the stage of asymptotic world. You know, if you look at the problem set we need to deal with, uh, you know, the web pages has grown into a sort of hundreds of billions of uh, uh, graph, and uh, I guess the web log is unbounded. It's hard to even put the upper bound on it today. And uh, so most of the mathematical systems, as, such as linear system of linear programming, we often solve problems with billions of variables, right? So even, you know, our computing device, like uh, uh, the, the Intel uh, chips, it began to have about billions of transistors. 
And just remind you that uh, in 94, when Pentium 2 first came out, it only had 2 million transistors. Right? So the so scale really, you know, it's really scaled up. So, so this basically is a world that uh, asymptotic complexity may actually matter because the gross order may govern the, the efficiency. So, but before we can fully you know, express our glee about the visionary of our pioneers compared with the, you know, the pioneers of my neighboring uh, departments, uh, so what we also realized that uh, you know, what used to be considered to be an efficient algorithm, like a quadratic time algorithm, is no longer efficient because the problem size is really large. So in many ways, so it's become more and more important to design an algorithm whose running time is close to the input size and occasionally smaller than input size. Right? So, so, so this is basically part of the need of designing sort of nearly linear time algorithm. So, <coughs> but you know, as a, as, a, as a community, we had made a lot of great progress in algorithmic development. So for example, many fundamental problems, some look simple and some are quite fancy, has been shown to be in linear time. They can be the basic mathematical problems. For example, I think still fixed dimensional LP, the Megiddo's algorithm is still quite fascinating, even to today's standard. And uh, you know, many graph algorithms have been accomplished to almost linear time. And many numerical algorithms have been accomplished to almost linear time even though some of those may need additional proofs. Okay. So, so if you look at this whole evolution of algorithm design, in many ways, <coughs> algorithm design is like building a software library. Right? Once we build a nearly linear time algorithm, and it can be used as a subroutine for future purpose. Right? So in some sense, the community is working hard to assemble this library of uh, efficient uh, subroutines, and we continue to build upon it for, for new primitive for solving more problems. Right? So, so today I would like to talk a relatively new primitive, what we call the Laplace primitive, and I would like to also to address some of the elements developed along with achieving this primitive and some of its applications. Okay, so, so how's Max doing now? I can speed up now? <laughs> Uh, <coughs> so, so, so what is Laplace primitive? I didn't understand what you just asked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to slow down again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so La, uh, La, Laplace primitive address a family of very fundamental problems in numerical linear algebra. So essentially it's considered the problem of solving a linear system. Uh, but the matrix of linear system is considered to be slightly special than general purpose. And uh, I would like to relate that linear system, the constraint, but also try to expand its applications. Okay. So in this linear system, you know, this is a fundamental question. You know, you, you give an n by n matrix, you have vector, you want to find uh, another vector that ax equal to b. And uh, so in our case, we consider a special family of matrices. First of all, it's a symmetric matrix. And secondly, we call it so-called Laplacian matrix of a weighted graph. So fundamentally, a La La Laplacian matrix is the following matrix. That is, is a symmetric, and the off-diagonal are all non-positive, and the row sum equal to zero, and essentially it's isomorphic to weighted graph. So for example, suppose we have a graph like this, weighted graph, with four nodes. It defines a Laplacian of uh, uh, four by four. And for example, this entry 1.5 uh, became negative 1.5 on the corresponding entrance because it's connecting 2 and 3. So that's why it's a, it's a row 2 and column 3 and uh, row 3 and column 2. Right. So this is an encoding of this weighted, uh, weighted matrix uh, graph. And we set the diagonal to be in such a way it canceled all the entries. Okay. So this matrix is slightly singular. I mean, it's singular, but it's slightly singular in the following sense, that uh, <coughs> if the graph is connected, then the north space is very simple. It just has you know, all one's vector in it. Right? So, so if a graph is connected, then we can still define a linear system, namely, as long as the B 
you know, the summation of entry of B is equal to zero, then it has solutions, right? Because it's in the proper uh, span of the matrix. So, <coughs> so one of the main technical results, which we would like to build upon as an application, and also I would like to explain a little bit of its technical elements, is the following result. So basically said that if you gave me a Laplacian-like matrix, which is slightly bigger than the family, but you can just think of a Laplacian, and I give you any uh, vector B, you can solve this linear system to the precision epsilon, essentially in time, linear in the number of non-zeros in this matrix, and with some polylogs, and also log in 1 over epsilon. So namely, we can solve somehow exponentially precise in almost linear time in the number of non-zero entries. So M corresponding to the edges of the graph. It's not N squared, the number of vertex squared, it's the number of edges in the graph. So namely, if the matrix is sparse, this really captures the sparsity of the matrix. Okay. So initially, when we produce this uh, solver, the O1 actually is like 20 something, 28, 27. So this was recently uh, uh, reduced to essentially to log M in a sequence of beautiful work by my thesis advisor, Gary Miller, and two of my academic siblings, uh, Curtis and Richard Penn. Richard is sitting there. So essentially, they, they greatly simplified the solver and basically said, in almost in the time of sorting, you can invert this matrix. This is fast, right? In, in, in almost time of sorting, you can invert this matrix. Okay, so, so that's basically the family style of a result. But the critical part is that uh, it has no dependency on lookup graph. Right? For any graph, this is true. And it is exponentially precise. The complexity only depends on one over log, log of one over the precision, rather than one over the precision. So those are sort of the, the, the key elements. And it's captured the sparsity. Okay. So, <coughs> So whenever we have, you know, we build a tool, we always want to demonstrate it's slightly useful, or at least other people will challenge us why this is useful. I remember as a kid, you know, my, my, my old brother is very clever with hand. So, so one day he actually improved the sling, you know, this is in poor China, and he built some gadget which allowed him to aim better of sling, slightly more complicated. We all said, what can you do with this? So he was very excited. He said, uh, he took us to one of these tree, which has apricots on it. And most of apricots are on the tip of the tree. And because we're short, as a kid, we couldn't reach there. So he actually aimed with a rock and tried to shoot an apricot. Of course, he missed the first shot. But then he actually did shoot down an apricot. We said, wow, this is really cool. You can get an apricot with this gadget, right? So, so I would like to demonstrate one apricot that I can catch for now. Then I would like to uncover this uh, solver. Okay, so, so one of the small apricots uh, <laughs> implied by this gadget is following. It's a high school problem we learned from physics class. Okay, so, so in this high school problem, essentially, we are giving a network of resistors. And uh, so on one end of uh, the, the network, we normally call source, and that's, uh, we, we, we set up voltage, for example, to one. And at the other end, we, for example, ground voltage to negative 1. Well, otherwise, we can scale them. We can set a voltage to be 9 and ground it to be negative 9, or 4.5. You can scale this any way you like, as long as uh, uh, if I relate with solver, it's much easier for me to say the ground is negative of the, the other side. Okay? So, so then clearly, because of the, the difference of the voltage, it will produce a flow. This is called electric flow. Right? And uh, so, so, so this electric flow obey many prop interesting properties. For example, the flow in is equal to flow out in every other place. Right? This is called Kirchhoff law. You know, you can flow in equal to flow out. Right? So what is even more miracle is that uh, this flow is a, a potential flow. In the following sense, that the, the moment you put a voltage difference here, it will define voltage everywhere in the network, in the nodes of network, which means the end point of the resistor. And the, the amount of flow along every resistor is just the voltage difference 
defi divided by the resistance. So this is called the potential flow. Right? So what's even nice is that uh, this potential can be solved by this linear system. So you can actually write out the potential function, the, the Laplace in times the potential function is equal to the discrepancy you put in between the, you know, the starting point and the ground. Okay? So this immediately said that uh, if you can solve this type of linear system in almost linear time, you can actually determine the flow in almost linear time. Right? So we solve this high school problem. That is, if you give me any network, I'm able to solve the electric flow in almost linear time. Right, so that's one of the apricots that can be shut down by this uh, Laplace solver. So right. S and T, uh, so I don't quite understand. S is a starting place, and T is an ending place. This is a vector of uh, uh, 1 at S and negative 1 at T, and 0 every other place. Okay? If you want a scale like 4.9, then basically you can set a 4.9 in one place and negative 4.9 in the other place. It will give it, it screw up the flow. And this flow can be computed in almost linear time. Okay? So in the number of uh, resistors in the network. So, uh, so of course, you know, not everyone cares about Africas. Maybe you like a big pitch, right? So, so for example, when we talk about within computer science, and most people say, who cares about electric flow? This is double E's job, right? When we consider flow, we actually consider maximum flow. Because we deal with the internet, we deal with network, and so on. The electric flow is really not our consideration, right? So what you can solve in almost linear time. So, so this is one of the flow we care, for example, within computer science. <coughs> uh, it's a fundamental problem, in part because it's interesting algorithmically, and also structurally is interesting mathematically. For example, uh, the, the basic ST flow is that you have a source, you have a destination, you have a network. It can be directed or undirected. Then you have a capacity on the edges. And the job is to send as much as flow to, from source to destination in such a way that you obey the capacity. And also obey the flow condition, namely the flow in is equal to flow out, other than the source and destination. Okay, so this is the, uh, the so-called max flow problem, and uh, I think in CS we also like it because you know it's one of the great example of duality for linear programming. Right, it's a very clean example to illustrate the duality of linear programming, <coughs> and uh, so <coughs> so so for example, in the special case of undirected max flow, namely you have an undirected graph which means that uh, you can flow either direction with the same capacity, right? And uh, even those, it's, it's, not, it's, uh, it's not a trivial problem to solve. And uh, in fact, the best result for this model, undirected graph, was still the 75 result by Evan and Tarjin. So basically, they proved that uh, essentially in time m to the power one, uh, 3 divided by 2, m to the power 1.5, you're able to compute the flow. So I'm not going to get into detail, but the one of the bigger apricots that we can shoot down with the Laplace solver is that uh, we're able to compute, for example, a, an approximate max flow in time m to the power 4 divided by 3 uh, with the penalty of approximation factors. So this is actually the first time the, the leading components went from 1.5 to uh, something less than 1.5. Okay. And uh, so since, uh, you know, uh, uh, Oleg gave a talk here, and uh, uh, so, so essentially the basic idea is that we reduce the computation of an approximate max flow to a sequence of uh, electric flow. And because the electric flow can be computed in almost linear time, it's a Laplacian solver, and uh, uh, when one properly somehow set the resistance, one can approximate the max flow. So I'm not going to get into the detail of this result, but essentially say that uh, this result basically call upon the, 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 the Laplacian solvers essentially n to the power a uh, cubic root of n times to reach the con uh, uh, convergence. So is it known to linear, we can do the 
Pardon me? Known to be NP. Is it known to be NP hard to approximate linear? What? I don't it's like four that. thirds. What are you asking? Whether it's hard. It's the best to you can do. Oh, he's asking, is it hard to go down? To go continue to go down. Yeah, uh, that's go a, that's a widely open question right now. So it's not known to be NP complete. Uh, we don't know whether we're able to accomplish that yet, right? But, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's our objective to aim there, try to continue to reduce it. It's entirely possible, yeah. <coughs> so, so, for example, previously for, for any network, the best result is uh, Goldberg raw. And essentially, the leading components is also 1.5. Okay. So, so, so hopefully, you know, now you have a few apricots in hand. If you feel this is sort of at least interesting primitive, right? So, uh, it, it, it kind of at least provides some new possibilities for design graph algorithms. Okay. So I will spend very quick time in solver, uh, also largely because of qu quite a few talks touch upon the solver. I will just be very quick, but I would like to focus upon some of one of the components of the uh, in the build up. Okay. So, <coughs> so how do we solve a linear system like Laplacian? So. You know, classically, when we solve so-called so symmetric positive definite matrix, uh, you know, in, in textbook, we normally teach Gaussian eliminations. But if you're a numerical analyst, it has always been since the 50s that you use so-called conjugate gradient or preconditioned conjugate gradient. And uh, so mostly, we use the so-called preconditioned version of iterative solver. So essentially, the basic idea is that in order to solve Ax equal to b, you do not solve it directly. You actually create a, a new linear system uh, with another matrix called B. This is called preconditioner. So you want to solve essentially B uh, to a negative half, A, B to a negative half, Y, and B to a negative half, B. So conceptually, you're solving B inverse AX equal to B inverse B. But this is a symmetric version of the preconditioner. OK? And uh, so. So, so Weijia is the first one. So Weijia is a colleague of mine from uh, Abandon Champagne. So he's the first one began to apply graph techniques to enrich the solution. So one thing nice about this type of scheme is that uh, B is under your control. A is the matrix you're given, so there's nothing you can do. You have to solve that linear system, AX equal to B. But the capital B is under your control. So the basic idea is to properly choose capital B that this whole process can be speed up. So this is called preconditioned uh, iterative method. Okay, many, many, many collaborators, ma many people have been working in this field. And uh, so, so if you uncover this basic idea from 50s, and which Vaidya put into the framework of graph solver, essentially it looks like following. You don't have to go completely into, the, into it. Essentially, it's, uh, uh, you run a few iterations, and basically, you need to solve linear system B because there's a B inverse there, right? So you have to solve linear system B, but the beauty is that you multiply a vector by A, right? We all know that a, a multiply vector by a matrix is much faster operation and can be done essentially linear time, right? If you maintain a sparse version of a matrix, right? So this basically reduces solving A to solving B and, uh, and multiply by A. A. Okay? But the beauty of that is that one can quantify how many iterations you need. So in fact, the number of iterations you need is, uh, can be written as the following. Log of 1 of epsilon, eventually we just ignore now. And then it's dependent upon square root of so-called relative condition number of these two matrix. So, so I will give a quick hint of relative condition number in the next slide. So intuitively, if it be equal to A, this is equal to 1. Which is clearly true, right? If you can solve B already, you solve A. In one iteration, you should be done. Okay? So it allows you to achieve epsilon precision. Okay? So, so what is relative condition number? Intuitively, it's following that when you have positive definite matrix, A and B, they basically define a shape, right? Because the eigenvalues define a shape. It's, you know, ellipsoid in high dimensions. And relative condition number basically tell you how those two shapes are aligned. So that's why mathematically defined to be most misaligned in one direction multiplied by most misaligned in the other direction. So this is called relative condition number. So standard condition number is defined 
when b equal to i, the identity matrix, which means uh, you want to compare every shape with a sphere. So here, basically, you compare two shapes. Or you can rescale by one shape, you look at the condition number. Okay, so it's the same language. So this is called relative condition number. And in this bound, it said that uh, if you can choose b that uh, can get this small, then at least you can reduce the iteration, but you have to pay the b to solve b. So, so essentially, the whole solver is about how to choose B for efficient solving. Namely, you want to simultaneously reduce the relative condition number, but also you want to ensure B can be easily solved. Okay? So, so in developing the solver, uh, one thing I find even more exciting is that not only we solve the problem, but also we're able to develop a suite of new nearly linear time algorithm for graphs. Right, because you're aiming to solve this linear system using graph technique introduced by Vaidya. But in order to achieve this, you keep on solving different graph problems in almost linear time. And many of those are look very new style of results. Right? So in particularly, uh, one I will expand is that we build so-called local clustering uh, uh, algorithm for larger graph. And we use that to develop a graph partitioning algorithm that's running almost linear time with performance guarantee. And uh, so we introduced uh, several other terms which I will explain, like spectral specification, and we utilize some of the early results on low stretch spanning tree to essentially build this precondition. Okay? So I will be very brief, and we only get into the technical part for local clustering. Okay? So essentially, as a component, this basically is how it's solved. That is, uh, uh, one thing we know how to solve efficiently is when a matrix whose underlying graph is a tree, then using Gaussian elimination, you can solve in linear time. So that's one of the family of matrices we can solve in almost linear time. If a gra matrix whose underlying graph is a tree, you just eliminate from leaf to root. You can solve in almost in linear time. Right? So the host B essentially is built R. We choose a, a good spanning tree. We add a few more edges to improve the, pre uh, the relative condition number. And that thing we we'll call it ultra specifier. <coughs> it's a, 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 a matrix whose underlying graph is a tree plus a few edges. And you want to say for every edges you, you add in, the condition number will drop accordingly. Right? So, so edges is almost like in building a bridge, namely a few more bridges will smooth out your traffic. You want to really make sure that each bridge you build, you have benefits. So this is called ultra specifier of the original system. And it's built upon a notion called spectral uh, specification I will mention briefly. And uh, I think uh, in the whole work, we like, you know, conceptually, we like this notion the best. It's a very natural notion for mathematics, but it's give a beautiful notion for graph specification. Okay. And uh, so technically, we basically build a clustering method, and we compute uh, partitioning, then we, we, we build a specification, then we build auto specify. And uh, Richard's work with Miller and uh, Curtis essentially remove this branch, they're able to build auto specify much faster. So, so, so today, actually, I will explain a little bit of this lost art, which is not need in this uh, solver anymore. But I'm glad that, uh, uh, you know, at that time we need, and we can develop something new. And actually, I really like this particular subroutine as well. OK? So, so this is basically how the solver schematically is built. You can see it's just all graph theory. So that's why it's really good for computer science to do this job rather than a numerical analyst, right? Because we somehow specialize in graph theory. And so before I talk about the, uh, the components, let me mention this notion called spectral specification, uh, which is a very simple notion uh, borrowed directly from numerical analysis applied to graph theory. So that is, <coughs> we are able to prove the following result. For any graph, dense or sparse for any graph. Suppose we build this Laplacian. We show that in almost linear time, you can build another very sparse graph, essentially has a linear number of edges, such that these two Laplacian are essentially similar spectrally. So basically, for every graph, we show there's a sparse graph. It basically looks like that graph. Okay. So I just give you a parallel notion that is, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I, when I was finishing my PhD, the height of uh, computer science is building so-called 
you know, high performance computers. So at that time, there was another company nearby here called Thinking Machine Corporation. They built a, a solid, uh, about thousand node computer, right? CM5, right? So CM5 actually was even featured in Jurassic Park it's because it's a beautifully built uh, device. And, uh, but if you undercover CM5, the, the network is used to coordinate the processors. It's a hypercube. Okay? So, 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 so then you say, why is hypercube? Uh, because hypercube is a good preconditioner, a, a specifier of complete graph. Right? Because in parallel computing, in many ways, you want to do pairwise communications. But it's very hard to build a device that has n square links. So, so, so essentially, we build a sparser device, which is called a sparsifier, which does not delay the communication. And in fact, one can prove that the hypercube can support all pairwise communication with very small delay. Right? So, so, so hypercube, it is a good sparsifier for a complete graph. And here, basically, we're building you know, hypercube for every graph. Right? So for every graph, it's a hypercube-ish graph that is sparse and, and uh, spectrally similar, which means the relative condition number of Laplacians are essentially the same. Is the graph weighted? Weighted. It's weighted hypercube. You can change the wire uh, uh, weights and speed. Right? So, so, <coughs> so we're able to show this in almost linear time. We can, for every graph, we can build this. And this, uh, again, was uh, further improved. And for example, in a very beautiful work by uh, Basin, Spielman, and uh, Srivasta, they actually uh, only need uh, 1 over epsilon square times n number of edges to build epsilon uh, specifier. OK? So, huh? Eigen function, what about the eigenfunction? So this basically means for every eigenfunction, uh, they are very similar. They, 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 the shape is essentially the same as before. So you could use this for dimensional reduction, too. Uh, it didn't change the spectral profile, yeah. Let, let, so that's the a, that's a statement. So you can build a sparser network. It didn't change the, the spectral profile. Okay. And so this work, again, was improved by uh, several later work. And uh, so for example, Richard's uh, uh, solver also built upon this, uh, starting from those idea and began to refine to build a better solver. Okay. Uh, so, 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 so basically, uh, some of old graph theory, like Ramanujan expanders, they are good specifier for complete graph, right? Not just hypercube. Ramanujan graph is also a good specifier. Okay. So when I write down this notation, essentially we will say Laplacian is spectrally closer. So those are sort of comparison of Laplacian bound. Okay. So <coughs> so one of the elegant ideas we borrowed from uh, from a uh, uh, Noga Long, uh, I think the Carp, uh, Dave Palick, and uh, Doug West, is this notion of a low stretch spanning tree. So that's basically the other components, together with Spotify to build a solver. And in the low stretch, stretch spanning tree, the basic definition is following. That if you have a graph, suppose you have take a spanning tree, uh, namely my black edges. And for every other edges, you know, you can think of this as a communication network, right? Because if you were cut, you have to uh, take a detour in, in, in the tree network. And, and this is a stretch is defined to be the, the penalty of a detour, the ratio of a new rod against your original lens. OK? So in a very striking result in 91, uh, uh, AKPW proved that uh, every weighted graph essentially have one spanning tree that has a very good average stretch. Namely, on average, the stretch is uh, an, uh, you know, m to the power little o of 1. So which means that uh, you know, it's amazing. There's one tree, for every weighted graph, you can find one tree. And uh, you know, some are, uh, have a long detour, but on average, you have a very short detour. Right? So the, the, the typical example is that uh, imagine your graph is this ring, you know, a graph of n nodes connected as a ring. And if you take away one edge, Right? So clearly, the, the stretch of this guy is n minus 1, but stretch of everybody else is 1. Take average is 2. Right? So this, show, this is essentially true for every graph. Uh, when you increase a 2 to m to the power of little o of 1. Okay? So this work was uh, later on improved uh, by uh, a paper uh, Dan and I involved. 
essentially reduced the average stretch to like log square n, and this was further proved to log n. So, so, so it's quite a miracle tree, saying that uh, with this tree, on average, your detour is basically within log factors of our original network. Okay? So it turns out that this tree, which is built for K server problems in the 90s, was very useful for solving linear systems. Because, uh, for example, uh, if you use this tree as a preconditioner by Bowman and Hendrickson, you can already solve every linear system uh, based on Laplace in m to the power 1.5 times log n time. So it's just one tree, you can precondition the whole thing already to something non-trivial. And uh, for example, lately Spielman and Wu uh, also show you can actually go even further in, in as a precondition. So, so essentially the whole idea of solver uh, is building this ultra sparse file which allows us to basically to solve this linear system almost efficiently but also it's a good preconditioner. So essentially it's just built upon the combination of sparsification and this tree. Okay, so I'm not going to get into detail. Those basically lead to the lin almost linear time build up. Okay? So, so, so the combination of those two eventually lead to the main technical result. As I mentioned, it was beautifully improved recently. Okay. So, so I would like to open the cover a little bit, especially to expla uh, explain one of the components that does not need the enriched solver anymore. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's one of subroutines which I also personally like a lot uh, to process graphs. Okay. So at that time, basically, for us to build a sparsifier, we need to solve a graph partitioning problem. But at that time, all graph partitioning problem take time more than a linear. It's not close to uh, nearly linear. So that's why we have to build a new partitioning algorithm which come to close to linear time in order to do the sparsification. Okay? So, so in the process, somehow, through a random poking, we get into a very beautiful graph problem, which I would like to share with you. Okay? So somehow, this is a, the beginning. Somehow, allows us to keep on building the graph tools and ultimately solve this uh, Laplace linear system. Right? So then, you know, you can get a few apricots of uh, flow problems afterwards. Right? So, <coughs> so clustering or graph partition is one of the fundamental optimization problems, uh, you know, combinatorial optimization. So fundamentally, we would like to divide the node of a graph into somehow subsets. And we would like to say each subset is self-coherent. Namely, you know, they are more richly connected within and somehow sparsely connected with outside, right? So this, this is a notion of a so-called good cluster. And uh, so one of the mathematical definition, which are often used in theoretical computer science to measure the quality of a cluster, is so-called conductance. Okay, so let me define what conductance is. So, so imagine that you have a graph, and you take one component called S. So basically, we would like to re uh, assign a quality for this subsets to say, you know, it has, it's a good cluster. And uh, so this mathematical definition is following that you count how many edges live in these subsets, and you divide it by the total number of degrees involved by this subset. So basically, this means what's a fraction of edges you use to connect outside the world. So this is called conductance, right? The fraction of edges you need to connect outside the world, outside the clusters. Okay? So, so you can clearly convert this into weighted notion too, right? If you have weights on the edges, you can also do what a fraction of weights you need to connect outside the world. And uh, we often define the conductance of set this way, and also conductance of a graph to be the set with the smallest conductance. And we often call this set to be sparsest cut. Okay, find the sparsest cut didn't be hard. Okay, and uh, a lot of work are about how to approaching a sparsest cut approximately. Okay, so, so this is conductance. And uh, <coughs> so in order to find a good sparsest cut, which we need for uh, uh, sparsification, at that time, eventually, a lot of those things are uh, circumvented, okay? So we look at, you know, the offshore partitioner at that time, and you will see, you know, the, the like latent raw style of a mathematical program-based uh, partitioning, it's just too slow. They take at least n square time, okay? Then there's a spectral partitioning with numerical techniques. 
the one of the deeper problems is it's a very unbalanced. Namely, you can spend uh, you know, at least linear time, and you cut off 10 nodes. Right? So, so then basically, in our world of divide and conquer, it's useless, right? Because you only cut off 10 nodes, you have to handle another huge graph. Right? So, so we would like to somehow get a slightly balanced cut that is sparse. Okay? So there's a, for special class, you know, just separate the theorems, like Lipton Targin for planar graph. And those are just too specialized because we want to handle all graphs. And there's also a lot of fast heuristics. People claim that it's also taking almost linear time. And it's just hard right now to get a complete proof. So as a theoretician, we have to be efficient. And we have to have a proof. The only thing we don't care is constant, right? So, so, so we, we have a certain slack. Not to worry about the constant, but we somehow have to get a proof almost linear time. Okay? So the question is, can we have any meaning for nearly linear time partitioning? So that was widely open at that stage. Okay? So, <clears throat> so in order to attack this problem, we began to somehow room it in into this uh, uh, simple problem of our partitioning. And this part I would like to share with you with a little bit of detail. It's called local graph clustering. Okay? So it's slightly different from our traditional partitioning. So the problem is the following. That I'm giving you a huge graph. And I'm giving you a single vertex in the huge graph. Right? You can think about the huge graph is Facebook. And this vertex is Jennifer Chase, her Facebook page. Right? And my job is that I would like to find a cluster somewhere nearby Jennifer, possibly con contain, uh, include Jennifer, with small conductance. However, I, would, I don't want to pay for the entire social networks. I only want to find such a cluster in time, linear proportion to the size of the cluster I output. So this is what we call local clustering. Right? So you can see there's a lot of conditions loaded here. I like to find a low conductance cluster. I do not want to pay too much because I'm budgeted to the side of a cluster. And, uh, uh, and uh, the hope is also uh, stay, stay nearby the original vertex. We can work on this very local model, namely just like our Facebook model. I first logged on to uh, Jennifer's Facebook page. I saw all her friends. That's the only node I can visit. Right? So you can only visit the, the friend of the people you know. You cannot somehow jump. There's no jumping operation. You literally start from Jennifer. You have to decide this. Right? Then the question is, uh, can you do something somehow remotely solve this problem? You must add one other conditions, because otherwise I could just output the whole graph. <coughs> the whole graph may not have small conductance, if you define so. I can define that. So suppose I ask you only output no more than half the volume. Exactly. Yeah. OK. No more than half the volume. Okay. So, so essentially, you know, I want to find a cluster with small conductance in time linearly proportioned to the size of the cluster. So this is just like, for example, you, you're standing in the Hawaii island. I want to ask you to find a cluster uh, in America, and you're not supposed to go to look at California. You basically say, hey, this is a cluster. It's not connected to anyone, right? So, so efficiently, you, you visit Hawaii, you say this is a cluster. But on the other hand, if you're in Florida, you probably chop off Florida, and without going to Massachusetts, you said, here is Florida, look like a nice cluster. Right? So, so you're able to pay a little bit more if you find bigger clusters. Okay? So, so this is a local graph class, a clustering problem. And clearly, you will look at this, it's clearly, probably, you can't design an algorithm that's always successful. Because you're limited with what you can look, and limited by time. So you have to allow this algorithm to say, sorry, I couldn't do anything. <laughs> Right? But the moment you find the cluster, I have to charge you to say, did you spend more time than the cluster you, uh, you discovered? If you spend too much time, I say, that doesn't count either. Right? You, you have to get very close to its output size. So this is what we call local algorithm whose complexity is required to be output sensitive. Right? It's output sensitive. Okay? So, so we are able to prove the following result has the following statistical guarantee of performance, rather than a deterministic per guarantee of performance. <coughs> and it is built upon uh, 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 random walk theory, and I will expand a little bit. And uh, so essentially, we are able to show the following. That, uh, so later on, I will show you, essentially, this is actually very useful subroutines. 
That is, imagine your uh, network has a good cluster called S. Suppose Jennifer is part of a good cluster called Microsoft, right? Suppose a Microsoft cluster has conductance phi squared divided by log cube of m. So those you eventually improve that a little bit, okay? You can just visualize like phi square, okay? So then, uh, suppose Jennifer is one of the random Microsoft employee, rather than our sort of fierce leader here. And uh, so then this algorithm will output a cluster with conductance bounded by phi. It's not as good as phi square, but has a bound. It's a quadratically scaled down uh, conductance. And uh, uh, mostly of Microsoft employee in time proportional to the output size. And uh, so we show that this can be a, this is true with half probability. So we said this, imagine Microsoft is a good uh, cluster in a social network. From a random employee of Microsoft, with half of a chance, I'm able to find another cluster whose conductance is slightly worse, but whose size uh, is proportion to the time I spend to find that cluster, and that the chance I can f be successful is half. So, so it's slightly twisted uh, uh, theorem, but I have to say it's hard to come up at that time a theorem that quantifies the success, because you knew you're not always successful, and you have to produce something which later on you can use for futures, right? So this basically said, if you put in the other way with randomization, it's become even more clear, saying that if you randomly choose vertex from within a cluster, and you randomly set up a, 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 a target size of the cluster, you know, from two to four to eight, then you know uh, the chance you can find a good cluster, the probability, is at least one over log n. Not too small probability. When I log in, you can get a cluster, and you paid exactly the budget time. So one of them will be successful, right? So that's, that's basically the statistical performance guarantee of this randomized process. If you randomly choose from a cluster uh, with probability one over log n chance, if you set up proper targets, you will be successful. OK, so how do we do this? We actually use so-called uh, ra rounded random walk. Again, this work also later on was improved by uh, Anderson Chong and uh, uh, Long then, and also Anderson Press. So those are a few of the recent work. Okay. So, so it actually uses a very beautiful uh, 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 theory of random walk, this one. Uh, so, <coughs> so one of the uh, elegant approach for graph partitioning, uh, in many ways pioneered by Chigurh, or at least implied in the argument of Chigurh, is to somehow produce partition based on embedding. So that is, you know, somehow you can lay out an embedding, then you can somehow scan through the embedding looking for a good cut. Right, so this is called the embedding-based partition. You somehow go from graph to geometry, then you somehow using the geometric uh, sweep to decide whether you have a good cut or not. So for example, uh, uh, in Chigurh's proof, you use eigenvector, and uh, in Mihail's proof, is use I approximate eigenvector. And uh, so what we are going to use is a, a theory of Lovas and Simonovici using the distribution of random walks. And for example, improvement of Anderson, uh, Chong, and Len, they use personal, personal page rank uh, vectors. Okay? So, so here is a beautiful theory of uh, uh, Lovas Simonovici in, in the volume estimation. And somehow it's imply a good clustering algorithm. So here is what they said. They said, uh, let's assume you start with a vertex. And then you begin to uh, perform a, a random walk. Random walk means that uh, a half a chance you stay where you are, and half a chance you uniformly go to your neighbors. OK? So clearly, random walk de defines distributions, namely, what's probability you will be where? Right? So let's that's, that's call that vector P of t at time t. OK? So here is a, a simple idea of Lovas and Shimonovich. They said, OK, suppose let's sort those probability. Actually, they sort the normalized probability 
is divided by degree. So here, let me assume for simplicity, the degree is, uh, is, is regular graph. Otherwise, you have to normalize by degree. Suppose you sort those probability from large to small. And uh, then they say, well, it's defined basically n minus 1 cut. Right? Just like the Chigger style. It, it define, you can cut out the one vertex, second vertex, third vertex, da 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 da. There's n minus 1 cut. OK? So what they proved is that if this random walk mixed slowly, if this random walk didn't hit is stationary fast enough, it's mis mixed slowly, then one of this set must have small conductance. So that's basically the statement. Namely, if all those sets have large conductance, then you have to mix fast. Which means if you have evidence you mix slowly, then one of the sets will have small conductance. Uh, so you think your T will go, depend on how fast you, you, you mix. T is typically in the range of log n, some constant times log n. Right? But if in early stage, you can also probably detect. The, so essentially, said it goes there, it still didn't mix. There must be one of the sets you examine already have small conductance. OK? So, so, so the proof actually is very, very beautiful. They define a potential function, essentially just uh, sum up the, the prefix of the the most likely probabilities. And then they show the following, a beautiful theory, saying that uh, uh, this is a stationary curve. Suppose you started with the initial curve. That is uh, sort of the, 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 the accumulation of probabilities. And uh, if everybody of the set has a good conductance, then basically this curve has to drop rapidly. So this curve has to drop very rapidly to, to, to the stationary. So they give a bound on how quickly this potential function somehow compress into this straight line. And, and, but then if you have a cluster that has low conductance, because each time you can see there's not much probability uh, are leaking. So you can demonstrate that you, you do have one point sort of somehow way up will create the contradictions. So that's where they can find the cluster. So it's just built upon this very simple Counting uh, you know, potential argument, essentially to say if you have, no have good, you have no good cluster, your curve has to draw fast. But but if you happen to have a bad cluster, namely a, a small conductance, then you don't leak the the, the, the probability fast enough. Then you have you have evidence something you didn't mix, right? Because when you have bottlenecks, you don't mix. So that's why it gives you evidence. Then they're able to simply go back here and to reveal one of them is good conductance. So this is basically the overall mathematical build-up. And uh, so what we are able to build is a build upon this theory. And the main thing, basically, is that when a graph has small diameters, when you iterate for log n iterations, you may quickly have everybody have some probability. Right? They may not mix, but you can reach everywhere. Right? Imagine that you have, you know, a, a, a graph is log n diameters, then clearly random walk have chance to go everywhere, even though you are not mixing, right? So, so what uh, Dan and I was able to do in this local clustering is to show that when you push the probability, if anything too small, you just eliminate it. So this way, you're only searching for a small neighborhood nearby a probability mass. So essentially, most of our technical proof is extending of uh, uh, Lova Shimonovich to argue that rounding does not hurt this whole theory of mixing. So if you just round a little bit, this whole theory of mixing is still preserved. And if you're able to guess where you round, you're able to uh, achieve a cut proportion to the cut size. So essentially, this whole local clustering is built this way. Okay. So, so, so this is one of the technical components uh, built up uh, along this way. Okay, so how much time do I have now? Ten minutes? Five? Oh, fifteen minutes. I have plenty of time. Okay. So any question up to here? So this is this local clustering algorithm, and uh, uh, I personally really like this theorem in part because uh, at the beginning, how to formulate the theorem is very challenging. It's they are sort of very uh, non-traditional theorem because uh, the limitation of your search and what performance guarantee you can achieve, right? 
So, 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 so even though this nibble, uh, you know, doing random thing will never successful, it takes little time, right? It turns out to be very, very powerful, right? So how powerful is actually solve the following problem? That uh, from nibble, you can actually find a partition in almost a linear time. So here is a very, very naive uh, idea. So essentially, it, it, what the partition problem we set up is following. Remember, we complain spectral technique may be too uh, unbalanced. So what we're able to show is that if a graph has a, a, a good cluster of, of particular balance, balance means uh, its volume divided by total volume, then we are able to, in almost linear time, to find another cluster, have a guaranteed conductance, whose balance is at least half of uh, the existing cluster. So which means that uh, if I set up a targeting conductance, if you have an, one cluster with a good balance, I'm able to find another cluster with half the balance. Right? So, so this allows us to achieve later on for uh, almost linear time for specifications. Okay, so this is one of the first algorithms for partitioning that runs in almost linear time with a performance guarantee. So this again was improved by the local clustering algorithm of uh, the latter two, and they are able to do this. So the basic idea to do is very simple. You just simply uniformly choose a, a node in the graph, and then you choose an anticipated size, essentially with the exponential distribution, and, and then basically you just run this algorithm with an anticipated size. If you find something, you're happy, but you only pay almost linear time, so it's still fine. And if you didn't find something, because of the probability you choose the size, you can argue that for each run, you only pay logarithmic time. And uh, then uh, the chance you find something almost uniformly intersect with every cluster. So this way, if you run m times, continuous on residual graph, you're able to peel off. So that's essentially the, the whole algorithm. So somehow, that uh, statistical performance guarantee can be used to achieve, you just continue to hack until you hack long enough, then you're guaranteed that you will get a good partition with a good balance. Okay? So, so I would like to summarize essentially by a few other applications uh, and also to somehow encourage uh, many of us to think this could be a good framework for designing many other graph algorithms, not just for MaxFlow. Okay. So, so, so in abstract, you know, what I, we would like to refer to Laplace paradigm is that uh, when we try to solve a problem, either on graph or on matrices, we would like to reduce the computational problem to a sequence of Laplacian-like solvers. Now, for example, the flow is a typical example. You'd reduce it to n to the a third of the uh, Laplacian solver. Okay? And uh, the hope is that uh, the, the nearly linear time solver will give the subroutine that we need to somehow encode, uh, to efficiently encode the solution uh, in an algebraic or combinatorial problem. Okay. So part of the reason we feel very excited is that it's very different from traditional uh, separator-based uh, divide and conquer algorithm, like Lipton and Tarjan, in the sense that uh, it does not depend upon the graph structure. Right? Laplace primitive applies to every, every graph. The penalty is the number of edges in the graph. Right? And also, the complexity <coughs> has exponential precision. Namely, the complexity only has log of 1 over epsilon. So you can run very precise in, in very little time. And uh, the hope, basically, is that we are able to solve more and more uh, graph problems using these primitives. Okay. So, so a, a few quick off, you know, I just finished teaching my undergraduate class. So I borrowed one, two slides from that class just to make a connection of uh, uh, the different uh, algorithmic uh, framework we often use. For example, greedy often runs in linear time, but you have to be very lucky to run greedy, right? We all know that. Dynamic programming actually usually is not linear time already, right? Often it's called quadratic. Divide and conquer is sometimes linear, but you have to be lucky with the structure, like planar graph is small separators, right? And mathematical programming is really linear. Right? It's hard to solve a linear programming in many ways. 
And the branch bond and bond hardly linear often has no proofs. And this multi-level method numerical uh, analysts really like is mostly linear with no proofs. It's anti you know, it's, uh, it heuristically explains almost linear time. And similar to a needing oral thing, it can be linear, but it's also you have to be lucky, almost like Brady. Right? So this is basically the landscape of many of our systematical tools when we teach our students to say, you know, if you're lucky, you can use greedy and, go, and so on, right? And uh, <coughs> so, so, so currently, there are quite a few uh, extension of application of this Laplacian solver to combinatorial problems. So for example, we're able to use it to approximate the, the second eigenvalue of matrices, which is a trivial application. And a beautiful result by being, uh, uh, James Lee and Press, they show that, for example, cover time of, uh, 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 of random walk on a graph how long it will take you to cover. That time can be approximated in almost linear time. And they reduce to the Laplacian solver. And uh, so for example, several uh, uh, learning labels on the graph are encoded as a Laplacian solver, the Laplacian kernels for learning on the graphs. And uh, 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 there's a numerical uh, extension of the solver. And uh, uh, so, 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 so for example, the particular one I mentioned, the max flow, I mean cut, uh, and, and uh, there's, uh, there's also like uh, 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 generating random spanning tree, one of my favorites. Uh, it's not just Madre sitting here. Uh, so, so there's a lot of places where once you have a faster solver, you're able to either provide approximation or directly solve a problem. Okay. So I have how many minutes? Five minutes now? Okay. So I, so I will show you some trivial one other than the flow. So for example, spectral approximation is probably one of the most trivial applications of Laplacian solver. Namely, if you want to, I give you a Laplacian matrix, you want to approximate its second eigenvector, the one with the second smallest eigenvalue. So the basic idea is that uh, you just co compute so-called uh, uh, power inverse method. Because we knew the null space, we can just power inverse it up. And uh, in the power inverse, all you need to solve is a, a linear system by Laplacian. And therefore, you can, in very small number of iterations, you can get high convergence, right? So, so even though it's trivial, it actually implies the following result. Just to give you one implication, that is, uh, if a graph has a constant degree, and its Fiedler value, the second uh, eigenvalue of Laplace, is lambda, then in almost linear time, you can find a cut of conductance square root of lambda. This, uh, this statement sounds a little bit fancy, but it's a trivial application of the approximation of the feed of the vector. Pardon me? Uh, the, running time, uh, uh, <coughs> the running time does not depend on lambda. Oh, well, it, it's kind of dependent. It's in the, it, it coded in the, uh, how precise you can get. There's a gap, yeah. There's a gap there. You, 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 you know, there's, it depends on the gap of lambda. Yeah. Good. So, so for example, for, for bound, uh, bounded degree, uh, planar graph or genius, you can approximately find a, a very high quality cut in almost linear time. I mean, there's other ways to achieve this, but uh, this, this solver can automatically produce a cut of conductance at square root of one over n. Because we know the eigenvalue is no more than one over n. Okay. So, uh, so, this, uh, 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 so, so they, they, by connecting the covering time, they're able to, s an effective resistance, they're able to approximate the uh, cover time in almost linear time. And uh, so, so there's many other applications. For example, one of the early uh, examples by uh, uh, Sam and Spielman, they show several of the flow problem can be quick, uh, solved faster than it was known before. Right? The kernel part also, again, is to reduce everything to the linear solver. Okay. So, so essentially, that is uh, the, 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 the state of art of this solver. Uh, many components, as I listed, are greatly improved. And uh, so, the, so but, but it's revealed so many, so many elements of graph theory are heavily related with numerical analysis. Right? So you can see the tools for spanning trees, for, 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 for partitioning, can be used to solve a linear system. And meanwhile, the notations like preconditioning or relative condition number can be used to define things like spectral specifier. So, um, 
So this is where we are. So thanks a lot. Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. I don't have a, a clean answer there. And uh, um, uh, so uh, if you look at a lot of matrix representation, many things can be kind of ex extended. But uh, in hybrid graph, there could be several possibilities. So for example, so what is a uh, what's Laplace for graph? Laplace for graph is really the sum of Laplace for edges. Right? So which means that uh, the basic unit of matrix is building upon this two by two matrix. And those are the basis function, and you're writing the Laplace essentially like summation of that. And uh, so for certain numerical applications, for example, like rigidity, people actually study like three by three, four by four type of matrix, almost like hypergraph. And then they compose them together uh, into a bigger matrix. And the sum of those theory can be expanded, but there's a lot of limitations so far. Yeah. So, so the other part, which is currently quite relatively challenging still, and there's no clean solution yet, is for direct graph. Yeah. So there, there are several uh, possibilities along the way, but uh, currently there's no, it's not a closed out yet. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> 